morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'm Steve Levin. I'm a council member here in New York City. Uh, I represent the 33rd District, which is in uh, Brooklyn, downtown Brooklyn, and Greenpoint, Williamsburg, um, Borum Hill, Brooklyn Heights, um, up and coming uh, areas, very expensive real estate, um, and uh, and really is a community that, that uh, needs to be doing more uh, when it comes to combating homelessness. Um, I also joined here uh, Minta Kilowan, our, our counsel to our committee at the General, uh, the, the General Welfare Committee, uh, of which I'm the chair, um, and I've been the chair for the last uh, five and a half years. Um, and uh, one of the challenges that we've been trying to face and trying to come up with uh, positive solutions for is how we combat uh, the homelessness crisis here in New York City. Um, and, you know, we don't exist in a, in a vacuum. Uh, we are, we have unique challenges here in New York City when it comes to uh, combating homelessness and our uh, construction of affordable housing and limitations on, on available land. Um, but many communities across the country, many cities across the country, um, are facing similar challenges and um, and coming up with innovative solutions and one of the most exciting uh, solutions that we are seeing throughout the country is LA County's everybody I everyone in campaign um, uh, and that's why you're all here is to hear about uh, the innovative work that they are doing in LA um, and I will read you a small bio of the everyone in campaign uh, in 2016, Los Angeles voters voted to enact a property tax uh, to fund $1.2 billion of supportive housing development through Proposition HHH. A few months later, LA County passed Measure H, not to be confused with Proposition HHH, another initiative targeted at ending homelessness. Measure H is, another, uh, Measure H is funded through a sales tax and will provide an array of services including mental health care, job training, and housing for individuals experiencing homelessness throughout the, the county. In March of 2018, United Way of Los Angeles launched their Everyone In campaign in order to monitor progress on Proposition HHH and Measure H, ensuring the ambitious goals are met. Everyone In has a 10-year plan designed to increase access to supportive housing in LA, while also providing public education about homelessness. Shortly following the launch of the campaign, United Way successfully secured commitments from each city council member to build 222 units of supportive housing in their districts by 2020. Um, starting with the goal to build 10,000 units, they broke this number into three years to account for each for council members' terms. Dividing the 3,333 units by 15 council members, United Way set the goal at 222 units per district. This was intended to ensure equitable development of new housing across districts while also holding each individual council member accountable. Now that this commitment has been secured, the campaign is largely focused on marketing and community engagement. United Way has hired eight community organizers to engage stakeholders around the issues and has held focus groups and conducted surveys with business leaders and members of the general public. Marketing materials include ads in the LA Times, billboards, and posters throughout different neighborhoods in LA. United Way is holding events across communities, including a pop-up where neighbors can use virtual reality in order to take a journey into homelessness, complete with a tour of supportive housing. The goal is to help Los Angeles residents understand what supportive housing looks like, who needs it, and how it impacts communities. And I encourage you all to visit their website, uh, which lays out the challenges uh, uh, before us, but then also uh, lays out what we need to do. And I uh, greatly appreciate the positive message of um, uh, saying we know, we know this challenge is um, historic in its size and scope, uh, but we also know what we need to do. We know it works, uh, and we have a vision uh, to ending homelessness in LA. And, um, and it's exciting to see that, and I think that there's a lot of lessons that could be gleaned 
for other cities, including New York City. So we're really excited to have our three panelists. Um, I will uh, read their bios right now. Mike Dennis is the Director of Organizing. Mike serves as the Director of Organizing for, Everyone in Camp for the Everyone in Campaign, a project powered by the United Way of Greater Los Angeles, which is focused on ending homelessness across LA County. As director, Mike is responsible for directing and managing all aspects of grassroots operations for the campaign and as well as the team of 10 community organizers in the field. Mike holds over a decade of experience in grassroots community organizing, issue advocacy, political strategy, and public affairs. He has focused the majority of his career to housing justice and affordable housing advocacy, building and overseeing complex public policy campaigns that fought against gentrification and displacement in extremely low income and working class communities of color. Mike also served as the, on the board of directors for the Right to the City Alliance, which is comprised of 70 community-based organizations uh, across 17 states and 23 cities that fight for racial and economic justice. Mike has coached, managed, and led dozens of experienced community organizers to carry out effective base-building base campaigns. Mike is also a professional photographer, organized, organizing consultant, and he holds degrees in political science and international relations from Cal State University Fullerton. Welcome, Mike. Um, okay. Uh, next, uh, Gabriela Garcia. Uh, Gabriela was born of immigrant parents from, uh, from Jalisco, Mexico, and raised in Pasioma, California. Jaquema. Jaquema. Sorry. Jaquema. Sorry. Okay. Uh, an immigrant working class community. Gabriela grew up uh, with values rooted in compassion and empathy for others and to be an active participant in her community, uh, which led her to begin her work as a community organizer and advocate around issues of land use, food justice, environmental justice, community and economic development, housing and homelessness, displacement and language justice, justice with various nonprofit organizations and community-based groups throughout Los Angeles. She's currently a director of organizing with the United Way Everyone In campaign and co-founder of the uh, Liberate Language Justice Union of Interpreters and Translators. Gabrielle lives in South Central Los Angeles with her life partner, Cesar, and her children, Metzlia. Metzli. Metzli yeah. and Joaquin. So welcome, Gabriella. And uh, we are also joined, sorry, I got to bring up the bio. Give me one moment. The mystery, the mystery. <laughs> By uh, Frank Romero Crockett. Frank serves as the impact communications and design manager at, the Uni at United Way of Greater Los Angeles and serves a key role in the Everyone In campaign, a community movement to end homelessness and housing crisis by fighting for affordable and supportive housing in every part of LA County. He draws from his diverse experience in community organizing, digital strategy, and storytelling to develop creative approaches to building widespread support for permanent solutions. Frank diverted, uh, diverted from his original career path in education when he taught in the Middle East during 9-11 and focused most, more on building community power through grassroots organizing, popular education, and communications. Frank has an education degree from Biola University and is an alum of the Coro Executive Fellows Program and General Assembly in Digital Marketing and lives with his partner and two daughters in Highland Park, Los Angeles. So we want to welcome all of our guests. Thank you for coming all the way across the country to join us here in New York City. Um, and I'll, t I'll turn it over uh, to our, our panelists. Um, but one thing I just wanted to, uh, to say, so, so um, while there, the, the, the face of homelessness may be a little different here in New York City than it is in LA, we have different laws, we have uh, different um, uh, legal precedents here. Um, in a large, in a, in a very serious way, we are ser uh, the, the solutions are the same um, and the challenges are the same. Um, and we know that supportive housing works here in New York City. Uh, Shinny has done uh, an amazing job of organizing around supportive housing in New York. Um, uh, but we still face a lot of nimbyism here. Um, and uh, you'll hear from a lot of communities, even those that are very uh, progressive communities, uh, that all of a sudden when there's a shelter to be placed or a supportive housing development to be placed, 
you know, all of a sudden there's a, there's a, uh, a wall goes up. And um, I can speak to my own experience that the way you, you, uh, uh, you, you address that is to engage and to explain uh, what supportive housing is, why it's needed, and why it's so successful. Um, and, and so I'm really excited to hear what this campaign is all about, how, how, it's, um, how it came about, and, and, uh, and how it's looking for the future. So with that, I'll turn it over to our wonderful panelists. And uh, before that, just really quickly, I do want to acknowledge um, Shinny, uh, which is uh, uh, just this amazing organization. And I want to thank uh, Laura Mashu and Cynthia Stewart uh, uh, for helping put this all together today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilmember. Um, hi, uh, again, my name is Frank Romero Crockett. Uh, I'm going to start off uh, just going through just a little bit of a rough agenda of today's panel, of what you could expect in the next, uh, what, hour and a half. Uh, what we'll cover, hopefully, in our presentation, um, if we don't cover it in our presentation, we'll definitely leave it open for Q&A. What we want is to have at least 30 minutes of question and answer at the very end. I'm sure some of you have questions about how we do our organizing, our comms, our engagement. Uh, but for today's panel, what we want to focus on is um, how we got to where we are today. Uh, how do we dream up the campaign? How do we launch it? Um, how do we get to Prop H, uh, HHH and Measure H? We want to uh, share with you our approach to organizing, um, how we frame our message in Los Angeles. We'll do a quick exercise, just kind of break up the time, so, uh, keep it a little bit interactive. And then we're gonna share our uh, top 14, which is our top 14 best practices of what we've learned over the last like year and a half of this campaign. Still young, we're still learning a lot ourselves, even as recent as last week when our uh, homeless count results were announced. And we'll get into that in a second. And again, last but not least, uh, we wanna leave anywhere from 30 minutes to 45 minutes in Q&A. So uh, that's the first part. But first, what we'll do is we'll give a, a quick LA snapshot just so you get a sense of uh, uh, where we're at. Again, uh, Proposition HHH and Measure H were both uh, voted in by the public uh, in 2016, 2017. Uh, overall, it's about 4.7 billion over the next 10 years. HHH, if you can picture this, is just for the city of LA, which is smaller. Uh, and that's only for supportive housing, brick and mortar buildings. Measure H is for the entire county, which is about 10 million people. It's very, very large. Um, and that's co covering some housing, but a lot of uh, services, outreach, uh, some prevention. So 4.7 billion over the next 10 years. There's a lot of money that's um, coming into the system and a lot of different organizations and agencies have, have had to triple in size over, those, uh, over this last uh, year and a half, two years. But of course, with the resources coming in, uh, what we have seen is that you know, just because you pour uh, resources and money into something doesn't mean it's gonna solve itself. We have to also recognize the challenges are, that are before us. And obviously, as a, as a council member mentioned, uh, there's local opposition or nimbyism uh, is, is very big. Uh, if you probably have seen some of, the, uh, some of the news, we're getting a lot of it in some of our coastal areas and some of our more affluent areas to the north in uh, San Fernando Valley. Uh, we're also dealing with the major obstacle of misconceptions. When we talk about supportive housing, which maybe about two years ago in LA, the term was permanent supportive housing, but based on our focus groups, all our surveys, we actually drop uh, permanent. So we are kind of leading the charge in LA County to say drop permanent, we're only calling it supportive housing. Uh, just because the permanent tripped a lot of the public up of, oh, this is basically free housing for the rest of their lives and we're paying for it. Um, that means they're never going to move. All these different questions came in, so we just went supportive because it sounds nicer and it sounds like something someone could get behind. So a lot of those misconceptions, you say supportive housing, they think shelter, and they think people lining up uh, in the morning and, um, and at night. Another major obstacle, of course, is political will, which is kind of waning. We do have our champions in L.A. County and the city. Uh, but that ebbs and flows depending on uh, the pressure. So kind of maintaining that and keeping that up. And even with $4.7 in resources coming in over the next 10 years, we still have a major obstacle with resources. Uh, $4 billion is a lot of, almost $5 billion is a lot of money, but it's still not enough. Uh, $1.2 billion for 10,000 units is only getting us to a certain point with 
um, our actual uh, gap, which is about 15,000 units of supportive housing for our chronically homeless population. Uh, but that number has probably changed because that number from the gaps analysis was back in 2015. Um, but there's resources for housing that lacks in the rest of the county. So uh, a, lot of our, a lot of our smaller cities are asking, well, LA City has received money to build housing. Uh, can we receive money in the outskirts like Claremont, Pomona, Whittier, as an example? So with all those major obstacles, um, about a few months after we passed both those measures, uh, the United Way had to think of, okay, so we backed both of these measures. We put all of our resources into the education, voter turnout, et cetera. Um, what do we do as a follow-up? So we dreamed up, we need to do a campaign that could do more of the accountability, the tracking, the engagement. Uh, we were thinking maybe we'll just do communications and comms, uh, but as time went on and as we had more conversations with our uh, developer community, all our service providers, the different agencies, and even the public, uh, we realized that we had to do more. So the Everyone In campaign is actually a community movement to end homelessness and the housing crisis by fighting for solutions that we know work, affordable and supportive housing in every part of LA County. And our goal is to activate those millions of voters plus throughout LA County that really support real solutions and really want to end homelessness. We know that they're out there but it's just a matter of they voted for it, it doesn't mean that they're gonna actually be engaged and actually come to uh, city council meetings, town hall meetings, and actually give public comment and say that they want it in their neighborhood. So those, that's the big difference. So the way that we're gonna activate these millions of voters plus is through our uh, three core uh, campaign strategies, which is first, we humanize. So uh, we do that through our communications, through a lot of storytelling, which we'll get to in, a, in about a minute. So humanizing the crisis, connecting it with people where they're at. Uh, next, we localize, not the, we localize the crisis and where people are living, but we also localize the solutions. Uh, and so we do that through our uh, organizing campaign. And I think we're at now 11 or 12 organizers. We have 12 organizers now. We just hired another one up in the Antelope Valley. So we have 12 organizers throughout our big region of LA County. And last but not least is uh, we go big. Uh, we're in the second largest media market outside of New York. L.A. is uh, there's a lot of things going on, a lot of things to distract people. So how do we keep this top of mind for folks? So that's why we do the billboards, the radio spots. Uh, recently, after the homeless count results, we even did chalking on uh, the sidewalk just to kind of make it feel more guerrilla marketing that people were talking about. So we do those core campaign strategies. And when we did a, we did a poll, um, we did a poll about a few months into the uh, campaign, which is also a few months after the money from Measure H started rolling in, and we asked uh, likely voters, June 2018 likely voters, these are the most engaged people, um, would you support supportive housing in your neighborhood for, and this is the words that we use in the poll, for the homeless, would you support that? And 69% of people said they would support it, which was very surprising to us because we were expecting 70% of people to be opposed to solutions in their neighborhood, not in their region, not in their council district, in their neighborhood, a few blocks away. But we actually found that more people are in support. Only 27% are total opposed. So that was our, that was our call to action of how do we find the 70%? If they're out there, they're the quiet majority we got to awaken the beast and push for solutions. Uh, this chart, um, what we want to say with this is because we saw that there's 70% of people that support solutions in their neighborhood, we saw from both Measure H and Proposition HHH that uh, over 69% and 70% of people uh, voted for those two uh, measures. What we are focused on in this campaign, which might be, uh, might be a surprise, is that we don't even focus on NIMBYs. We don't even focus on convincing them, persuading them. We don't care about them. Um, so when we share that with our different agencies and also philanthropy, they're just like, well, we need to focus on NIMBYs. We actually say, no, we, we could actually do more if we focus on the folks in the middle, uh, the folks that are neutral, the folks that are on the fence, the folks that haven't made up their minds of what they think about the homelessness crisis, what they think about the housing crisis, let alone what they think about the solutions being in their own neighborhood. 
So for our campaign, uh, if people are yelling at us and screaming and yelling and saying all these vile things, uh, we're not focused on them. We're focused on the people that are quiet in the corner who really just want some information. They want to hear some good facts, and they want to know if this is something sensible for their community. So we focus on pulling the neutrals over to our side to be passive um, support, but then that's through our engagement, our comms, our storytelling, all our events. We're trying to get those folks up the ladder into active participation, actively coming to city council and um, standing up and speaking out. So what are bananas, by the way? Oh, yeah, bananas. <laughs> Banana, so NIMBYs are not in my backyard. Banana is build absolutely nothing anywhere near anyone. <laughs> <laughs> That's, so if you, you don't know banana? No, Start no, no. using banana. Start using banana. Uh, yeah, so banana. <laughs> um, another key thing that we found in the very beginning of our campaign, you know, when we started doing collateral and all our website stuff, we we're like, oh, we, we need to throw out facts. We need to do fact sheets. We need to give people information. They need to see pictures of supportive housing. Those things work but they don't work on it their own. So when we start throwing out all this collateral with information, paragraphs, store, I mean, not stories, paragraphs, numbers, <clears throat> bullet points, what we soon realize is that facts don't fix fears at all. Yes, maybe an authority figure who comes in saying, I'm the chief of police and I support this, I validate this project, I validate this development, that might help a little bit. But that's why we really stuck to humanizing and storytelling because you can't have a fact come in to somebody if it doesn't make any sense or doesn't provide any type of meaning for them because people will interpret facts however they want to support whatever they're thinking. So we always think about doing a fact sandwich. So as an example, if the fact is supportive housing is 90% effective, then what is the story that's going to be wrapped around it for that person, that resident, who's neutral, to say, that's sensible, that makes sense. Uh, why wouldn't we support that? So a story delivers a context so that your facts could slide into new slots of your listeners' brains. So that's what we focus on is facts don't fix fears. And we always talk about how do we make a fact sandwich. That's our like, little shtick. So I'll, I'll turn it over. Beautiful, Frank. Thank you. Uh, we're going to be going back and forth. Um, it's great to be here with everybody. I'm going to talk uh, very briefly because we're, we're actually shorter on time than I think we had thought. Um, about the drivers uh, that are pushing the homelessness crisis in Los Angeles. Some of this stuff you all know already, um, but some of this is very unique to Los Angeles, so we wanted to kind of give you some context. Um, and also just piggybacking off of the fact sandwich, these are all, like, these are all facts that we want, to, we want people to walk away with. But the way, we, um, what the, the way we talk about these things is we fit them into narratives. Right, so, um, but these, these are kind of some of the key drivers. LA is going through a horrific housing crisis. Um, how many folks are from, is anybody from LA in the room? Hey, awesome. LA, All right. Represent. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, shout a neighborhood out for me. Our what, what neighborhood are you from? Santa Monica. Santa Monica, okay. okay. West Side. Reseda. Reseda, oh, okay. Reseda, Battleground. Right, we got some, we actually have something cooking in Reseda right now. Um, so, for folks that aren't familiar with, Los Angeles and the housing crisis, we've, you know, we've had a massive uh, boom uh, in construction. The economy has been red hot, and it's basically made uh, the rich a lot richer and the poorer a lot poorer. And what we've seen over the last night, 17 years, actually, is that wages have actually gone down uh, 3%, while re rents have gone up 32%. Um, so that's, that's a major issue for us. Rents across the county, this is staggering, Okay. 600,000 people pay more than 90% of their income on rent in LA County. So when we think about homelessness, uh, you know, we, I think for the unwoke uh, person, your average Angelino, uh, seeing an encampment on the street, they don't realize that that's, what, one, that there are many types of homelessness, but that's one tiny piece of homelessness, right, is seeing encampments and folks out on Skid Row. That's the tip of the iceberg. Below the surface is a 600,000. These folks are one disaster away from falling into homelessness, right? Th these folks are on the brink. And so and we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the key learnings we've had. We've focused a lot on 
uh, the supply side, building more units, but there's also this inflow problem. And if we don't address this along with supply, doing renter protections, uh, tenant rights work, you know, uh, right to counsel, lots of different things are sort of being discussed and, and dealt with. Like those, those all have to work in concert. 53% uh, of people experiencing homelessness for the first time said that it was because of an economic hardship. So this is also another important driver we want people to take away that uh, we want to break the myth that uh, you're homeless because you chose to be homeless or because you made a bad decision and um, you're service resistant. You're not willing to come inside. We hear this constantly. Um, and it's just not true, right? More than half of folks didn't want They didn't wake up one day and say, hey, I want to be homeless. Um, they, they had this done to them and, you know, then the cycle, you become deeper and deeper. If you're working a job, uh, and you lose your apartment because you got evicted, um, there's only a certain amount of time you're going to be able to work that job and live out of your car, right? There are practical considerations. There's practical barriers to being able to hold a job and not have a roof over your head. And that's what we want people to take away is housing first, right? We've got to get people inside and then we help them address their issues. And then the other, the other really simple but hard truth is that we just don't have enough affordable housing. We, a lot of folks will say we have a housing crisis. Yes, that's true. But actually the more accurate way to discuss this is that we have an affordability crisis. We've got plenty of units getting built every day. There's luxury condos. Uh, coming up all over the city, all over the county, the vacancy rates are really high, right? The vacancy rates for affordable units, for rent-controlled units, is less than a percent in L.A. County. So we have an affordability problem. We need more affordable housing. We need more supportive housing. Um, and, and when we're talking about affordable, we don't just mean new construction. We mean, uh, you know, naturally occurring affordable, rent-controlled uh, units, uh, we have 680,000 rent-controlled units in L.A., but we're, we're losing about 15,000 a year. <laughs> Next one, please. The other one we really, we really uh, feel is important um, for folks that, again, don't understand this issue, don't work in this industry, is that it, it does not affect everyone equally. Um, this map right here is actually a, a, an early map of Los Angeles, and it shows redlined neighborhoods. So you see those blocked out. I know redlining is an issue that is unfortunately part of New York's history as well. Um, but you know, th this connects up with what we've seen today uh, with uh, racism, gentrification, um, certain neighborhoods being um, affected much harder than other, uh, certain communities being affected much harder than others, particularly the black community in Los mm -hmm. Angeles. Um, black folks make up 90% of LA but they make up a third of the population of people experiencing homelessness, right? And, and a lot of times it's really easy to talk about housing, uh, the policies, but we don't talk about institutionalized racism. Um, we're not talking about uh, some, of the, some of the economic conditions that drive folks uh, or keep folks oppressed, right? Keep folks stuck. Um, and we have... We've tried to start to shift this narrative. We mm -hmm. want to talk to folks about these issues because um, you can't, you know, it's just, you can't look at just the, the housing supply side. You can't look at um, drug addiction and mental health issues. Like these are the things people's brains go straight to and it's a lot more complicated and layered than that. Cool. Yeah. All right, it's my, t my turn. Everyone, thank you. Uh, for being here. Again, my name is Gabriela, and thank you both uh, for sort of bringing us to sort of the current state of where we are now. Um, you might have heard it did cause uh, national headlines. You know, we currently are at almost 60,000 uh, people experiencing homelessness in Los Angeles. So it was an, a 12% increase from the previous year. And we're seeing, you know, number 24% of that was youth. Uh, that has increased. There was also an increase with, with some of our elders. And so we're, we're seeing this and all of these drivers, all of the policies that have driven. And just to give you sort of uh, a number, so the number uh, that of people experiencing homelessness in Los Angeles would fit in Dodger Stadium. And now, uh, now also occupying the field. So right, we're at a, um, just, to, uh, just to sort of give you that, that picture. 
Um, but but we, what we do, where we are at, at a good place is that we know what works, right? All of you have heard supportive housing, where we see where we see also where we can bring that number, so almost 60,000 uh, people experiencing homelessness on any given, uh, given night. When we, what we do is we actually then break that number down on the regional level. We have spas in Los Angeles broken out by counties, and then we break them out by council districts and then by neighborhoods. And that really brings, that localizes the solutions and it makes us you know, really move forward in a way that we can say, all right, we can, we can really make this work. And what we know is that, you know, we do focus on one fourth of the population of those, of those numbers, our most vulnerable um, neighbors, uh, unsheltered neighbors. So those are the folks that are gonna die within the next six months if we don't get them housed. And we know there's different strategies, right? We can get them directly from the street into supportive housing or into interim housing, and we'll give some examples of what we're doing. And then the other third, fourth of the population is are the folks that um, Mike framed, right? Those are the rent burden uh, residents in the city that they're a paycheck away f from being homeless. And those are the solutions that, you know, that w and it's episodic, it's also, right, someone might, might have lost their job, so they're gonna maybe need uh, just some rapid rehousing or some rental assistance to, you know, uh, find a place of hotel voucher until they get a new lease. But uh, the other percentage are really folks who need s affordable housing and who need um, renter protections and we need to preserve the units that we have, right? Those are the, the other solutions that we're also focusing on. And this is an, just an example of how we break down the region, right? When we're talking to, when we're trying to out, go out there and organize residents, when we break, that, break out the number, for example, in San Gabriel Valley, if we say we, all, we have for um, you know, almost 1,500 uh, individuals experiencing homelessness, and out of that percentage, you know, for this one in particular, you know, 486 of those individuals are chronically homeless. So if we look at that number, and then the rest, we can actually find other solutions that that you know brings people in and say, all right, like we can actually build something from here. Yeah, I, kind of what's a good point with the number when we keep repeating 58,000 or whatever number that might be. People feel overwhelmed. Yeah. They don't feel motivated to do the actual work. But when we break it down either in region or city, like for instance, the reason why we, we break it down between long-term and short-term and we need to build supportive housing for long-term or chronically homeless, when we say the number 486, we could actually paint the picture of that could mean four supportive housing apartments. And that could solve it for your entire region of San Gabriel Valley. So people get, could get behind and picture, oh, if we build four, we could really tackle this thing. So that's yeah. why we break down the number. Right. And then similarly, this is another example where, you know, we have 26 uh, people in Compton experiencing uh, chronically homeless, uh, homelessness. So then, again, that could be one unit. And folks can say, all right, let's identify and cite some land that's either owned by the city or the county and really uh, partner that with a nonprofit developer. And we have something that we can now push through the Compton City Council, for example. And then just moving in through, again, some of the solutions is at the heart of it, we know that homes do end homelessness. And it's snapshots like this that we can really build out through the city. That's part of our communication, right? It's something easy to remember. And, and some, of those some of those housing strategies are bridge housing, which is interim housing that actually comes with the wraparound services. And folks can stay, and individuals can stay from you know, 60 to 90 days, or actually the, the goal is until they can move into a permanent supportive housing. And then we have supportive housing, which you want to know, uh, wraparound services, uh, and really a sense of community to really become whole again and, and, and build. Yeah. Yep. And then I'm going to pass it over to Mike to talk about the fun stuff that we have. We still have to do. Well, so I, I kind of referenced this earlier. Um, you know, we've, we've spent the majority of, the, of 2018 talking really about that, you know, about the supply side, right? Building more housing, homes and homelessness. Like these things we know are true. But, you know, with the new, the new count coming out, it kind of affirmed a lot of our own suspicions. I, you know, Gabrielle and I have worked on housing justice issues for a long time, like, you know, doing tenants' rights work. So we, we've been thinking about these things for a long time. But, you know, when we saw the new count come out um, uh, last Tuesday um, and the increase in first-time folks entering homelessness was staggering, right? And it just it really affirmed that we, we can't just talk about producing housing. 
we've got to be talking up about preserving uh, existing naturally affordable housing, protecting tenants, and then producing new housing, right? So um, it's, it's, it's one of these things that, you know, moving into, tw- moving into the end of 2019 and then, you know, into 2020, we have to be able to recognize these things, make direction shifts with our campaign strategy, and not be delusional about, like, what we're talking about, right? We, we, again, we have to be looking at this on a holistic level, um, and that means that, uh, you know, United Way is not going to be on the top of the hill with, with the flag um, leading tenants' rights fights, but, uh, but it can be doing solidarity work. It can be doing uh, a little bit more to push folks that are been, have been leading those fights, and there are so many good organizations and talented groups um, with really engaged bases across Los Angeles that, um, that we are fortunate enough to work with mm-hmm. on this campaign that have joined uh, our coalition. So what I'll do is, um, so a lot of the, the uh, solutions and the numbers, again, to, to break it down, what we do for the kind of on the comm side of building support from different residents is breaking down the number so people could see this in more bite-sized pieces in their own local neighborhood. For the solutions, as you saw with the bridge housing and supportive housing slides, <clears throat> people just don't know what they are because they automatically assume the worst. They think about shelters from their own experience. So we do anything from housing tours, Uh, we've done virtual reality 360 video. If they can't make it on a housing tour, which is very hard to do on say a Saturday morning for two hours, we will bring, we have like 12 different VR goggles that we take to different events just for people to see it. So another way that we do it is through video. So what we wanna do is just show kind of one of our videos uh, where you'll meet Linda in supportive housing in the North Hollywood area, which is more in the San Fernando Valley uh, area. So check this out. experienced decades of homelessness and, and a lot of trauma because trauma comes to us when we don't have a safe place to be and sleep. It's bad out there in the streets. I don't know if I was more scared of the rats or the rapists. I grew up in a party house with my mom's in and out of relationships and just a lot of drugs being sold out of our house, um, police going through there all the time. Sometimes too. I think I fit in my skin now. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, tears are gonna come because I'm kind of happy. I'm happy that my son, I remember the few days ago, my son said, Mom, you're gonna be okay now, aren't you? <laughs> I said, Yeah, I'm gonna be okay now, Kevin. Okay, his name's Kevin. People do get better, and recovery does work. I think supportive housing would be the best thing for all of us, actually, because it would make our streets a safer place for everybody. Cool, just a short, short video. Uh, what we're going to do right now a- after the video is uh, do a quick exercise. Um, uh, one thing what we want to show kind of like what we do with our organizing and engagement is through a, uh, what we all experience probably in town hall meetings. This is where we see kind of the, the local opposition or NIMBYs really come up. So what I'm going to have is I'm going to have Mike uh, lead this part of the exercise. Uh, what we're going to do is try to get a sense of what you know or what you've experienced with town halls where um, we see much of the battlegrounds uh, happening. We're going to have a town hall about town halls. We're going to have a town hall about town halls right now. I'm going to stand because I hate, I hate sitting in panels. Yeah. Um, so I was thinking maybe uh, this will just be popcorn so you guys can like scream, scream things out. 
Um, we're going to talk. So I, I guess I'm going to preface this by saying that, um, you know, one of the core things that we do is we come in and we help. We work with, uh, let me, well, we do a bunch of different things. Let me see if I can roll this down. We, we work with developers to make sure that they're doing good community engagement, right? And so it's, part, it's one part, like, making sure that the project doesn't go down in flames. And then it's also making sure that folks in the neighborhood walk away feeling like, all right, this is, like, something I can be proud of, right? This is an investment in my neighborhood. Um, and so we do, we help them work community meetings. And then we also will convene our own meetings, which are much friendlier, safer spaces because they're folks that we've identified uh, through you know, different outreach efforts that we do. We put them through our trainings, we wake them up, and then we try to deploy them out to meetings like this, right? So they're showing up and they're saying yes to solutions. Um, but we also, you know, a lot of times we have to go, come in and do damage control. <laughs> I mean, there's another way to put it. It's, uh, mm -hmm. There's a developer that's got a project that's not by right, they need some discretionary approvals, and everybody in the neighborhood hates them. Mm -hmm. Why do they hate them? Because they haven't done anything. They haven't done anything to build trust, right? So we have, we, we get around that by, you know, all the organizers on our team, they all have roots in the neighborhoods they work. So they go in and they talk to the local community-based organizations, small nonprofits. We even deal with the neighborhood councils, which is not the funnest thing to do. Um, and we build relationships with folks. So that, we didn't really talk about it a whole lot, but that's what our organizers do. I mean, they're out there building a list of supporters, and they're building those relationships. And then we're using, you know, we use the, the muscle of United Way to help prop up the work that those local groups are doing, too. So it's, it tries to be like a symbiotic relationship. So town hall, there's a bunch of characters in play. This town hall particularly, this is, uh, this is in Venice, uh, Venice Beach, California, is um, you know has been dealing with homelessness um, for a very long time. Uh, it's gotten it's gotten worse. Uh, it's also become a very very wealthy, like kind of obscenely wealthy uh, neighborhood. Um, and a lot of folks that live there have you know their own property there. They haven't lived there very long. You know, five years, ten years. You got people coming in. Uh, screaming and shouting about things and wanting uh, homeless people to be gone, um, and then you dig a little deeper and they just move there from, you know, London or wherever, right? So it's a little infuriating as an Angelino, somebody who grew up in LA, to see people behave this way. This town hall was, uh, was put together because um, there was a strong neighborhood opposition to a bridge home, uh, bridge housing being proposed on Metro and land, and um, and so the mayor, Garcetti, Eric Garcetti, uh, the police chief, uh, a few other characters came in and they tried to uh, work the room, uh, try to alleviate fear. So, you wanna? Oh, yeah. So we're gonna start with a, a few different characters in this community meeting. So the first one is developer. This is, this is actually Amy Anderson. She's, uh, she's the head of, she's actually the um, uh, executive director of PATH Ventures, which is uh, you know, a supportive housing developer. Can folks kind of just shout out in the room for me, what's the goal of the developer in this situation? What do you think the goal is for the developer? Tax credits. Tax credits. <laughs> Tax credits. Tax credits. Cynical, <laughs> but true. To get approval Getting support for the project, getting approval from the community, good. Mm -hmm. Get everybody on board. Other thoughts? You said permits, and then you said Cynthia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all these all these things are true. But at the core, it's to put together a project that pencils out uh, and gets built, right? Yeah. Um, so this, this is not where she wants to be right now, I can promise you that. No. <laughs> then we got the police chief, Michael Moore. Um, you know, he's, he seems like a nice guy. Um, <laughs> why would the police officer be in the room? And, and it doesn't have to be this specific meeting, I mean, any community meeting, why would police officers be in the room? What would be the goal of the police officer? Uh, 
alleviating concerns, I think those are the two key words I heard yeah. for sure. Other folks? Public safety. Public safety? What do you mean by that? Yeah, so they, so a lot of times, you know, he, they do come in because they're often viewed as the voice of authority. Folks trust the cops, particularly people that um, are afraid, uh, don't have all the facts. They hear a police officer come into the room and say, hey, look, um, you know, this actually will help. The problem is police officers rarely do that. They actually validate a lot of the misconceptions and the fears that – NIMBYs or bananas are going to have, right? Um, they, they, we've, we've had time and again, you know, we have, we're having a really good conversation with folks. We're getting them uh, thinking about the benefits of supportive housing. And then a police officer says, well, I can tell you nine out of ten people I run into on the street, they don't want my help. Yeah. Right? And it's, well, yeah, they don't want your help because you're a police officer. <laughs> and, and, they, and you're going to probably likely end up in jail, mm -hmm. right, if you're, if you're somebody that's unhoused on the street. But in this particular case, he wasn't doing that. He actually wasn't doing that. He was, he was actually trying to meet folks in the middle. Next character, the elected official. Uh, what would be the purpose of the elected official being in the room? Yeah. Say that again? <laughs> Sorry, Steve. This isn't, this isn't uh, yeah. wasn't for you. <laughs> That's, well, yeah, that's, that's one way to put it for sure. Does, it, does having an elected official help or hurt? Depends. Yeah. Depends. W when does it help for yeah. some of the situations? When partially, when you say elected official is somebody who's respected by the tribal community, who's been elected to serve and uh, is not up for re-election. <laughs> yeah. We have the right yeah, yeah. experience. Term limits. I got you. There's someone in the back. Yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna keep moving here. In this particular case, you know, and, and we've seen this a lot that elected officials can be lightning rods, right? Um, if they're walking, so it depends, right? Sometimes if they have the if they have the trust of the local community, um, but the community's not really down with what they're proposing, it's not going to be as vicious and hostile. But if you walk into an area like Venice. Uh, and you're Eric Garcetti, um, you really rile people up, right? People got really hostile, were yelling and screaming. And to his credit, I mean, he, he stayed there till the very, very bitter end. Um, and, and he took questions, right? He took questions. But, but what was happening was people were emotional. They were excited. They were pissed off. Uh, how dare you do this? Mm -hmm. You know, how dare you ch shove this down our throat? Mm -hmm. We could send De Blasio next time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, send him our way. And then we got the NIMBY right here. This is a real guy. Um, <laughs> I, I took this photo. I took this photo, actually. Um, so what's the NIMBY trying to do in the whole situation? Shut it down. Shut it down. That's right. Is it, in, in any of your experiences, is the NIMBY actually like interested in finding a solution, or are they just trying to get it out? Yeah. Trying to get it out. <clears throat> And that what he's holding is probably an iPad uh, and paper, but he's also trying to organize, trying to get as many email addresses as possible from other residents who feel the same way. Yeah, and, and that's a really good point because we have a room, of, you know, a room full of 300 people um, that the city has, con you know, the mayor and chief and developer, they all came in and they, um, they convened this meeting. And then the NIMBY comes in and he's just skimming right off the top. Right? He's got people signing up. We organized for him. That's the problem right there. It's like we, sh we need to be organizing our own people. So when we do, you know, we have to deal with meetings like this sometimes, but when we're not on a deadline, the smarter thing to do is actually be going out, identifying that, you know, who's in that 69% that Frank talked about. We got to go out and find those people and train them up and be have them ready for when these moments happen.
right? Then the final character is the media. What is the media, what, what is the reporter, what story is she gonna tell from tonight at this meeting? About the fight, right? About that conflict. That's all they care about. Everything else, and then what got lost in the whole conversation? The project, the people. The people, what, maybe one of those 970 that died on the streets of, of LA sidewalks last year could have been in this unit, right? That completely got lost in the whole conversation, but there's something else, and I'll give somebody $20 if you can tell me who the other characters are in the room here. Who, one of the most important. One of the most important, the, the most important characters. Homeless folks, Mike Bonin. Somebody said Mike Bonin. Oh, I like that. Oh, 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 that's twenty dollars. Right twenty dollars. <laughs> Come see me after. <laughs> Jim and Mary. <laughs> that's who you need to focus on. <laughs> yes. So why are Jim and Mary? We don't know if that's really their names. <laughs> we just made it up. But why are they? Why are they the most important people in the room? Oh, th- we're pushing them to, the, to our side, to the left. Yeah. Move we're trying to, to we're left. trying to move them to the left. <laughs> They're moving to the left. Yeah. Ma'am in the back. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Super. Right, exactly. Sir? That's right. So earlier we talked, we showed that graph with the neutral thing. You don't have to go back to it. Oh. But those folks are in the middle. They, they came to the meeting. They weren't sure what was going on, but they know it's an important meeting. And they're, st- they're sitting there patiently watching everybody around them act like animals, <laughs> screaming and shouting. Uh, they've got their no dumping on Venice shirts. They're unfurling these disgusting banners with really terrible slogans on them about homeless people. And Jim and Mary are chilling right there, like trying to find out how many units are going to be in this building. Mm-hmm. Who's building it? When Who's is it building coming? it? Yeah. Right. right. What kind of social services will be in it? Yeah. What's, right. So if you're Jim and Mary and you see this just uh, anger, right, and yelling, will Jim and Mary come up to the next meeting nope. from 5 to 7 p.m. on a Tuesday? Nope. They're not. Because of what they saw, they're like, this is disgusting. Why would I want to participate? So if we, if we can't organize them in that space, we actually just created, like, like Mike said, we just created a town hall for NIMBYs to organize themselves. We did them a service. So how do we, how do we organize? And, and so then what we did was we actually like flipped that on its head and really reshifted as we're shifting the narrative of people experiencing homelessness and how people view it. We also physically shifted how we built out these spaces. So we, we actually went to an open house format, where as you can see, no one is holding a mic. So, because immediately the person holding a mic becomes a target, right? So that could be any one of us who then suddenly becomes a target in that space. And so we created a space where people actually can come and really have one-on-one conversations with the developers, with the service providers, with the, um, the, the folks who are going to pro- be providing sort of the management of the supportive housing, and they talk about house rules they go down so you actually can actually really then Jim and Mary could get all the facts for them to make up their mind of if they're going to be to the left to the left and so we really then create these really uh, these great opportunities to to do it to engage so if my biggest concern is like who's going to live here what's the tenant um, selection process I'm going to go directly to the property management company potentially right so then we're really free to engage and sort of roam in the space. It's, it's also less intimidating, right? Like it's really a space where it's like you're, not, you're really talking to neighbors. And it also gives an opportunity for us as organizers also to, 
to, to really organize people in the space because then we're also able to engage folks directly. It's more civil, right? There's no, there's no uh, front and center space. So then we really, there's no center. So everybody's really just free to, to engage with each other. There's no grandstanding, right? There's no opportunity to create, um, in, this, in Spanish it's like un escándalo, right? There's no opportunity to, to sensationalize or to really cause. And, I, and actually I'll give an example. We were at an open house uh, for a, um, for support of, for bridge housing in downtown, and there actually there was opposition, but because we had created this open format, even for this open house, it was we, there was media and there was you know it was really intense, but it was like this corner that it didn't impact the engagement of the people who were actually there to get the information. So that's another really um, really good point because yeah. then to this point is like the opposition. There's no space to organize. You know, in some cases they've like refused to come into the space um, and they've just created sort of you know but then little by little folks were trickling in they're like all right like we were able yeah. to move a few folks and it, even in some cases with the open house format some of the opposition that showed up and started yelling demanding a microphone demanding a stage to, for them to yell um, supporters in the room actually booed them to say like you're just you're ruining this whole open house please step outside so yeah did you have a question yeah Well, usually sometimes it's like putting out the fire, as Mike would say, like once it comes and we come together. We actually did, this did happen with the developer in, in West Carson, where it was, you know, a first gathering, or maybe, right, no, it, it was, was a follow-up. It, it was a town hall it, we, did, we had done with, uh, with Amy's uh, organization, and, um, you know, we hadn't, we hadn't been part of the organizing efforts ahead of this town hall, but we were asked to come in and help staff it. And, uh, and the whole thing blew up. I mean, it, it turned into a nightmare. And, and, and Amy, who's really awesome with dealing, she's very, very patient. I'm not patient at all um, with idiots. Um, and she, she did a really good job. That's not an job. acronym, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> she did a really good job trying to answer folks' questions, but, um, but she got just crushed by the room. The second time, the second time we did a meeting, though, we, we moved to the open house format, and all those folks that had showed up the first time and used Nextdoor, which we didn't bring this up. You guys know about the Nextdoor app. It's like one of the worst things to ever yeah. happen to supportive housing development. Um, that, you know, they didn't organize the same way. Um, and we were able to get folks the information they needed. We still had really, really good turnout too. There's still a few hundred folks there. Um, and you know, we felt good about it. We felt like it yeah. had done what it needed to do. And that's also now our role as organizers. And you know, now we're getting um, now a lot of developers and even city officials are leaning on our team to bring in and really sh curate these spaces and then their community engagement process because this has been has really been successful that now like council council you know offices are calling us hey we're gonna have an open house can you come meet with my team so we can like structure something like you did last time in in, in West Carson or sometime in, the, in, in another space. Um, yeah, so for, uh, because we promised about 30 minutes of Q&A, we're, we're at that 30 minute mark. Do so we, we can just run So through. what we can do, we do right now. We have a plan to win. Um, <laughs> let, let's go through these really quick and then we'll open up for Q&A because many of you probably have some questions, yeah? Okay. Can right. we go through, we'll go through this fast. Yeah, we'll go really quickly, and we've been show, we've been giving you little snippets of it. But you know, we've now engaged. We just in March, not just now, we're in June, but in March we celebrated our one year anniversary, and since then we've now engaged about ninety one thousand people um, uh, throughout the county, and it's been you know through through one on ones, through through so many. This is our awesome team that we are now all throughout LA County. And you know, no other service agency, no other organization has as this size of a team really working specifically to be that bridge in the community to bring in the city and the county together. I think that's, I always speak of us in this way, we're like sort of that in-between bridge that can play that role because we're not, no, we're not representing the county or the city, so we play this really, really specific role. Those are all, all our awesome folks. Um, these are the active sites that we're organizing. So then we also have very place-based strategies. So when there's a proposed supportive housing development support per, or uh, bridge housing, then we then um, localize our solutions, right? We localize our, our organizing strategies and tactics into these specific neighborhoods. So our team is really 
you know, countywide going deep. We're going grassroots level while we have an air campaign, while we have also organizing sort of the politicos, the grass, grass tops folks. And right now, we've across LA County, we have uh, 64, you know, 64,424 units of uh, approved, and we are we currently have 18, uh, 1,812 units uh, in the pipeline and under construction. I'm sorry, under construction. So that's big. And what we're going to do? We should probably stop right there. We'll save the rest of the slides. We we'll probably use that for Q and A, but we'll stop here get some questions, and then maybe we'll show you a few more slides. But we definitely don't want to leave without sharing our top 14 uh, best practices, things we've learned. So we'll go ahead and start Q&A. Yeah. Um, so I have Either one. Hit us with the hardest yeah, questions. Yeah, yeah, hit us with some questions and we'll go. And feel free to just take the mic and pass it around. Yeah, you can, yeah, or yeah, you can yell. This is, we're all friends. We wouldn't do this in, uh, in L.A. With, with the mic, free mic. Yeah, we would not give you yeah. all the mic. <laughs> Good morning. First and foremost, thank you. Um, I'm fascinated by your, how you're changing the narrative. Um, I'm curious, when you're giving tenant stories or client stories, I, have, I didn't see much about the folks you're serving in a sense of, you know, their chronic homelessness or their possibly comorbid conditions. Mm -hmm. In New York City, folks, in order to get a lot of the supportive housing, have to have chronic homelessness and serious mental illness or substance use disorder. Mm -hmm. Is that part of the narrative? And the only reason I ask is a lot of the bananas, as you call them, yeah. the NIMBYs, <laughs> latch on to that. Yep. So we're trying to do a lot of mixed population buildings, but is that ever part of the narrative, or do you try to not to focus on that so folks can't latch on to that? Yeah, uh, it's a mixture of both. Like, yes, we want to humanize and tell their stories. Um, if you if you if you saw kind of in our presentation, we focused uh, we focused on affordability housing crisis, really to pull residents in. Because when we get people in different community outreach settings or house parties, uh, when they when we talk about the ho homelessness crisis, they can't relate to the homelessness crisis because either they haven't experienced it or they don't know anyone, right? So the way that we draw them in is through the affordability crisis, and that's how we t uh, talk about the issue. Once we have that framed, then we could go into, well, we have solutions. There's a thing called supportive housing that's appropriate for the chronically homeless population. These are the folks that would fit fit or like are appropriate for this, right? Folks who are experiencing mental illness, uh, physical disabilities, et cetera. But we don't focus so much of the story on that. We focus more the story on the actual solutions and what supportive housing does. So we almost have our own 2080 rule. We focus 20% on the crisis because people actually feel the crisis wherever they're at. Doesn't matter if they're high income or low income in LA County, they feel the pinch of rent and uh, wages. Uh, but we focus the rest of the 80% on the solutions, the plan to win, get people motivated to the, do the actual work. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see who gets this. And again, feel free to pass around the mic. And uh, This is a great presentation. Thank you very much uh, yeah, for all your comments. I have a very simple question for you. You mentioned a few times that you know, you know what works. And, and you know that uh, uh, your uh, strategy has been a proven success mm -hmm. for, the, for, the, for the folks that get supportive housing. Could you define what you mean by success? One of the slides was like 90% yeah. success, yeah. I think, something yeah. like that. What do you mean by that? I mean, success to us means that they are permanently housed, right? Um, and, and in the case of... I mean, in perpetuity, right? Like if somebody is fortunate enough to get placed in a permanent supportive housing unit um, and you fast forward five years from there and they're still there, that's, that's a success story, right? Yeah. Because they're, they've, and we, we have, you know, as a photographer on the campaign, I actually, actually get to talk to a lot of clients. Um, and there's, there's one gentleman named Roy, um, Native American man, was on the streets for 27 years, um, had a severe uh, drug addiction. Um, he's, he's now in permanent supportive housing, uh, and he's, he's uh, an art teacher uh, for the building now. He's a very talented artist. Um, he's, a, you know, he's, like a, he's an elder to a lot of the youth in the neighborhood, um, and he has like a different level of respect. And for him, like you can see you know, being able to see folks really be whole again. I think there's that, there's that nebulous success 
and then there's the con- you know then there's the statistical success. Mm-hmm. Statistically, we want them in the house. We want them permanently housed, never back out on the street again. Yeah, but this is also a data point that supportive housing developers actually track. So it's anywhere from, uh, and I think uh, Community Friends just told us this uh, last week. It's anywhere from 86 to 92 percent, meaning the, uh, these are the folks that retain housing after one year. So uh, nine people retain housing, one person uh, actually falls out of housing. So with the 86 to 92, we just say 90%. When we say supportive housing has a 90% success rate and we repeat that distilled message over and over, people say, well, it it sounds like a solution that works. People retain their housing, why not? So uh, one other thing that we say with our message is that uh, when someone goes into bridge housing or a shelter, they are still experiencing homelessness. But when they move into permanent supportive housing or supportive housing, they are no longer experiencing homelessness. That in and of itself opens people's minds of like, well, we should do the supportive. We should end it. Let's get that to the root cause. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mike, Ariel, and Frank. It was an excellent presentation. Thanks. My question is, uh, LA is one of the few cities that New York can relate in terms of the homeless population and the homeless crisis. You indicated that in the last year there was a spike of 12% yep. in the population. New York has an increase all over the time, and for the first time, we have seen a little small. Oh, that's and awesome. can relate to that one. How do you think that the supported housing in LA will impact the um, increase in the, in the homeless population? Will that decrease? Because in New York, for every unit or every homeless that we place into supported housing or permanent housing, there are two more people waiting online. Mm-hmm. So the census never goes down. Yep. Or never reflects all the efforts and the support and the programs that we have. Yep. How can you relate to that one in LA? Yeah, um, I mean, one key stat from this last homeless count was that um, every day we house, we, either supportive housing, raptor housing, or just permanently placed in some way, 133 people per day placed in permanent housing, but that same day, 150 uh, are driven into homelessness. So we're, we're dealing with this numbers game of, so we have 6,424 that are approved and cited, but that means that's not gonna open up for another, what, two, yeah. three years. Right, 1,800 are under construction right now. So that's the part that has overwhelmed us. This is, last year we experienced a 4% decrease. We didn't pat ourselves on the back, but we showed Measure H money and Proposition HHH money is working and everyone's like, okay, we'll give, we'll give the county and the city and everyone in a shot. This sounds like it's working. All of a sudden it spiked to 12% and we're looking like dumbasses, right? <laughs> of being like, we're doing all this work. We're spending all this money doing comms, organizing. Um, but now it's making, it, it really pushes the question of like, we really need to talk about protection and preserving because we're not doing that enough. So uh, just a follow up. So you think that that is part of the holistic approach to make sure that when you implement all of these solutions, the problem cannot increase, but there is a way that you can basically stop the problem at one point. Yeah. 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 Not a stop, but try to control it. It's got to be an and, not an or. Right? Yeah. We've got to be we've got to be doing both things. And I think we've we've known this. We've all known this for a long time. But I think now that the numbers are getting worse and worse, um, and you're seeing like literally our efforts are canceling out the the amount of folks that fall into homelessness. Um, we we can't be uh, we we can't be delusional about this. Right? We've got to be real about um, about the fact that part of the solution means like stopping it from happening in the first place. Yeah. And you know, the general public, they're smart, right? So you throw out a lot of numbers, it's not going to make sense to them, but 58,000 is getting, is going to get them upset. What they do know is basic math. If we say 58,000 are experiencing homelessness, but Hey, we approved 6,424 units of supportive housing. Isn't that great? They're like, big deal. (laughs) That should be a hundred thousand. Why can't you do a hundred thousand? So, that's where we have to have the bigger conversation of like, well, we need to preserve the units that we have. We need to fight for this. But, you know, anyways, I'm going to stop right there. Thank you. Yeah. Um, that was an amazing presentation. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions. Um, I, I'd like to hear a little bit more about um, specific actions you've been able to get the neutrals to take in supporting you, and whether that's just around citing or sort of like you know bigger advocacy. Um, I'm also curious in your communications campaign if you do anything around children. We have 23,000 homeless mm-hmm. children in New York, and it seems like, um, especially from public perception, it's sort of you know 
received differently than street homelessness and it's a kind of a different issue to communicate so wondering if you have mm -hmm. strategies around that and then my last question is if um, cost concerns come up from the public at all when you talk about the construction of housing mm -hmm. and just wondering um, if so how you handle that so I'll take I could take the the uh, organizing question then I guess the last part is yes I mean I literally saw an email come through from one of our uh, leaders in, in Reseda um, you know concerned about hey these all these units are costing half a million a piece yeah. you know it's it's, it's crazy yeah. um, just for a ha you know, for one home right um, the on the organizing side um, some of the key things I think it's probably one of the slides we skipped um, but we have, we have like a host of different things we do, but the basic formula is because of the air war being so extensive, we drive everybody to the website, right? So if people go on everyoneinla.org, they sign up. Once they sign up, they get immediately connected with one of our organizers and sent, the organizers will follow up with them. And the organizers, each of them have two trainings a month in their turfs. So they have, and we, and we have a training curriculum. I'm not going to get into detail right now, but basically we teach people how to go out and organize their neighborhood. Like we can't do it for you, but we can help start that fire and then deploy you out um, to build your own cohorts, tap into your networks. Um, and, and so we, they do those trainings. Um, I'm sorry, when new folks sign in, there's a training somewhere near where they live. So we send them to those trainings. After they've gone through all of those trainings, then we have them engage in a bunch of different ways. One of the basic low lift things we ask people to do is host a house meeting, right? Because they can basically bust open their phone, look at their favorites list, and ask all those people to come over. It's really low lift, doesn't cost anything. Organize, an organizer can come in and help kind of do the pitch. But the idea is that we're building lists of people. Um, we do uh, supportive housing tours. These are really, really effective for people that are like neutral slash yeah. not really they're very skeptical right they're not full on NIMBY yet um, get them <laughs> in a supportive housing building get them with a tenant and supportive housing and then the whole thing just kind of their fears sort of crumble we've seen that like really really uh, it surprised me a little bit how much it's worked um, I'm kind of a cynical person and I, I feel like a lot of times you know people decided they hate something they're gonna hate it no matter what you tell them um, but but it actually works then we do like kind of bigger, uh, you know, more curated events, storytelling events uh, and pop-ups. So the storytelling events, we work with local neighborhood leaders uh, who've experienced homelessness. They will give testimonials about their life, their struggle, their story. Um, and we sort of weave that in with, with a call to action. Like, hey, next week uh, in North Hollywood, we're going to have um, a huge community meeting about um, a PSH project for seniors. Um, and so, and we had 300 people at the storytelling event, you get the call to action and then all of a sudden you get like at least half of those people showing up at that community meeting. It's, it's awesome. Um, so yeah, I'll I would, shut also, up I would also just add, we also have a great sort of biweekly, um, call in training. So it's just like, start where you are, pick up your phone during your lunchtime. Um, and it's an, an ending homelessness, uh, 101 where you, you know, we, you have your our co-hosts here we have this great uh team that really and this is a place where folks from all over the county connect and even now all over the country there's been folks have that have called from outside of the state i'm sorry and it's really an opportunity again to just get some questions answered get some facts get sort of like this is what it is this is like the basics of everyone in contact your organizer similar to sort of other events so we definitely as organizers always have a call to action and, and always an ask so i think that's always something good to keep in mind as, as the engagement is happening. So for us, that's yeah. really key, I would say. And then and you could, uh, we'll probably take two more questions before we go into the best practices. But to answer the question about children, uh, we haven't. Again, uh, we've only, the campaign's only been around for about a year and a half. Uh, so we focused a lot on the chronic homeless population because we're focused on uh, doing supportive housing. I'm sure we'll get there, especially with the youth count coming out saying that the youth uh, spiked 24% over this last year. That's probably going to be more of a conversation. Also, the elder population last year spiked 22%, specifically in certain uh, regions, certain um, uh, districts. So uh, we haven't got to that point yet, but I'm sure we will. Again, this campaign is going to be around for another, hopefully, another like eight years. Uh, we can continue, continue to do this work. Yes. Now, I just want to know who are y'all successful moving out? Families, single women, single men, 
That I mean, do you do you know um, mentally ill? Who's moving out? Who's moving out of supportive housing? Yeah, yeah, who are y'all successfully moving out? Families, women and children, mm -hmm. mentally ill. Yeah. Oh, you know, I just want to know what category. Oh, we yeah, no, I mean, it, it, I mean, all of those categories. Yeah, okay. I think the hardest population yeah. to sell to the public yeah. have been single units. Oh, single right? units. Single oh. adults. Okay, now, because what I'm saying is that in New York City, it's easier to, to link and to move out a single male or woman than it is a, 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 a woman with, uh, with children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, it's much easier. Yeah. So that's I just wanted to know that. Another thing, too, do y'all have housing subsidies, subsidies out there in L.A.? Oh, yeah. You have vouchers. Mm -hmm. Yes, but yeah. there's nowhere. They got vouchers up the wazoo, but there's nowhere to place them, oh, right? Because okay. yeah. the, the landlords don't want to take those vouchers. Okay. Yeah. So we have, a, we have another part of the problem, which is the landlord population being really uh, unwilling to, yeah. you know, to help. We have a, a law in New York City that makes it illegal for source of income discrimination. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, it, I, I know, I'm not saying it works. I'm not saying it works. <laughs> We're trying we for that. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, but, but, it, but it is, uh, you know, it's, in, it's technically enforced by our Human Rights Commission and it's, uh, you know, it's on the books. So yeah. we don't, yeah. we're not quite, New York is ahead of us in a lot yeah. of ways. We have right to shelter and too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so not yet. And yeah. I would also add that I think we're also looking at, uh, even supportive housing developers are now seeing really combining affordable housing units so and mm -hmm. and supportive housing units so so 50 50 in a yeah. project yeah. that uh, elect the organization mike used to work with um is partnering with hoveness who provides uh, transition age youth uh housing so half of it will be for families and the other half will be for transition age youth so that goes back a little bit yeah. to the last question so there is like mixed populations yeah. that are coming in as well That's good and the last two questions, and we'll do the best practices. Great. First, I want to thank you for a fantastic presentation oh, yeah. and incredible work that you're doing. This is just thank you. incredible. Thank you. Let's all break. <laughs> <laughs> what a team. He makes what a team. Look uh, amazing. So I'd, I'd be interested in getting your feedback on this, um, what your thoughts are. Uh, my organization uh, runs a homeless shelter and permanent supportive housing programs. We were engaged in a very bruising relocation uh, battle mm -hmm. last year. Uh, the project ultimately didn't go through for a number of reasons, um, part of which was the nimbyism and bananaism. Uh, it became a highly politicized situation. Uh, the, NIMBYs, the NIMBYs were uh, politically motivated for reasons that have to do with this particular city and, and whatnot. Um, so we're lying fallow right now um, but trying to re-engage community leaders. And um, because it became so politicized, um, there still is um, a sense from some people that they don't want to get involved. Um, we're putting together a stakeholders committee and we're reaching out to different components of the community. And one component that I reached out to, somebody who's very supportive of us, runs an, a nonprofit organization, that's very active in the community, went to her board and said, well, they decided they, they don't want to get involved in a political issue. Hmm. And this political issue is feeding hungry people and housing homeless people. So if you have any thoughts about hmm. sort of uh, how you move forward in that context where it has become so politicized mm -hmm. and how to uh, begin to reframe that, I uh, might be interested in your comments. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's, um, there's a longer response to that, but I, I think like quick hits on this would be that, um, you know, if you, if you don't have a team that can kind of be like the forward team mm -hmm. to really go in and work the area, work with faith-based institutions particularly, have been really, really helpful in this stuff for us, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and sort of build those relationships long before and, and I know that you're not in that situation, but like the, as far in advance as you can go into a neighborhood and building those relationships, the better off you're going to be. Um, and I, you know, in terms of the politicizing of it, we we have to beat the drum and redirect people. Mm -hmm. You know, as you have to be a broken record about this. That this is not. Yeah, the, the same thing happens with us too. It's not a political issue. This is a humanitarian crisis, mm -hmm. um, and we have to reframe that constantly. And if you're talking to folks that don't hear that, go out and find new folks. Can I just add one thing that I, I thought was fantastic about your website, and it's a very deft use of, of politics, 
is you have this uh, on your website, the 222 section, mm -hmm. which is each city council member, because they all you got them to all agree to do it. They all hate it, too. Right, right, right. They all, but they all agreed to do it. Yeah, they did. All 15. But they didn't know we were going to track them afterwards. Right, right. <laughs> so. they don't and like they're this. all being tracked. They're all being tracked. Yeah. And so some of them are pretty low, like yeah, very bad. zero or yeah, zero, 13. 13, 22. Six yeah. percent, and then some of them are doing quite well, and it's just a level of accountability. But it's using a little bit of that pol uh, political engagement in a very deft way, mm -hmm. kind of light footprint, not yes. crazy, you know, not like in a way that's like going to make them really angry, just yeah. a way to make them a little uncomfortable. Yeah, and they yeah. could agree to a minimum of two hundred twenty-two right. units yeah. in three years. They're like, yeah, we could do that. That's, that's right. easy, right. but right. it's not apparently for some. Hi, welcome to New York. Uh, uh, thanks. Yeah. Um, so I just had one thought and then I had a question. As you were talking about your pie chart where you had the bananas and the NIMBY yep. and you had uh, passive allies and active allies and then you had the neutral, yep. I thought it was really nice in your presentation that you broke down 